Hello? Hey, this is Mike Schwartz. Hi, this is Mohammed. <laughs> hey, Mohammed. Hey. I'll just give it a couple more minutes for everyone to get on the call. I'm just going to paste a link to the attendance list. So anyone that's, oh, everyone's already familiar with the drill. If not, or if you're new here, please uh, just add your name. And if you don't want to be called upon, just please put no update in parentheses next to your name. Or if you're new, just uh, leave it blank and we'll introduce you during the check-in. Uh, I think there's a couple of folks that are having some trouble with the, the new login system for Zoom. Sorry, what was the last bit? They're having a problem with the login? Yeah, it's now, uh, I think it seems to require a Zoom login to actually join the call. Um, I guess it makes sense. Yeah, I had a problem with articles that. two weeks back on pranksters going into public meetings that weren't secured. <laughs> I, I had a problem with that a week or so ago and opened an issue to have us move away from Zoom, hopefully, for lots of reasons, not just this, but. I recall that. I think you also put together um, an issue in the tracker there on GitHub, right? Yes, yeah. Is it something that, uh, hmm, I was debating this myself, like, do you think it makes sense from your perspective, Zoom for public stuff that we don't mind uh, sharing? I mean, the only time I think we'd ever have to change anything in a public meeting is if uh, for some reason we had to edit a video because someone accidentally drops an F-bomb or something. So. Um, do you think that Zoom is still acceptable for public stuff and then any private correspondence we get a WebEx or Slack instance? Well, I mean, they've, there's a lot of other concerns, like anyone who's using the Zoom client on their system, I hope is doing so inside of a virtual machine or some other contained environment um, that make me fairly nervous about Zoom in general. Um, and there's also things that, you know, there's a nice report by Citizen Lab talking about some of the privacy and other concerns with Zoom in particular about how they've gone about doing things and providing keys to, uh, you know, on servers in China for reasons that you can probably guess and so on. So I, I, I don't feel, I, I think it's not just something where um, there's like the one tiny potential, like the one tiny thing that happened that is the reason why you move away, but I think there's just a whole litter you know, like just a massive number of reasons to perhaps not use Zoom, especially since we're SIG security. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, the yeah, way you I, drive to, I, you I, have to run it in a VM or a box, then that's pretty concerning. It sounds like basically malware. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Apple's um, Apple pushed something that removed functionality from Zoom's client. Uh, as part of like an update that they did a year or so ago. So, uh, and that's like unprecedented for them. They usually only do that to remove malware. So I'll let you draw whatever conclusions you want about it. How do they do that? Do they sandbox it or some sort of security that, policy that locks down syscalls or something? Or? The way some people paint it is that like, do you recall entering your administrative passwords to get it installed? It kind of miraculously arrived on your system, which is why it's so popular because it's so easy to start using it. Right. But you can actually, you know, it raises some question like how it's happening. You don't need, like need to put your root password to get it installed. Well, it can do a lot. <laughs> this almost feels like it warrants a review itself. No, it's not <laughs> a review, but. So Matthew, do, do your, um, you know, your comment about you know public versus private uh considerations um you know just to, to riff on on where capos was going like that with that uh for us in particular 
um, you know, we are, you know, essentially modeling, uh, you know, to other groups. And so if we um, use the technology and, you know, therefore kind of promote it, um, right, we're seen as, uh, um, you know, SIG security and authority in cloud native space. And then, um, you know, the technology that we're leveraging and everyone sees us, you know, and joins our meetings and is invited to use that technology, um, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't play well. Well, Justin made a good point and this runs a bit against the one you brought at the previous meeting on let's go, you know, get on the same ship as everyone else within the CNCF versus let's be the vanguards of security given it's in our, it's in our group's name. Um, do we have a point of contact for say whoever or which individuals set up the automated, say, YouTube uploading and stuff like that, because if that's a process that's easy to replicate with another software stack, I'd be happy to at least get started with that and act on this. That's, that's automatic inside of Zoom. <laughs> just, just yeah, happen. but it, it's, it's not, a, I don't think it's exclusive. Um, no. I, I'm it, trying it, to remember which one, whether it's... Streamlined. Yeah, I'm trying to remember whether it's Blue Jeans or WebEx or something else I've used has it. And there are definite pros and cons to really all of these systems, but we should, I think, I think it makes sense to at least consider alternatives, um, you know, especially now given so much more is known. It was, you know, Zoom was always something where there was a fair amount known that it was problematic, but it, it was, I think you could have made an argument three months ago that, that Skype and WebEx are worse. And now I think that would be a pretty hard argument to make. They feel pretty equal to me now. In terms of reliability, security, usability, adoption, or? Um, in terms of embarrassing security vulnerabilities that have been recently published, comparing things like the, uh, the WebEx RCEs and um, various Zoom vulnerabilities that people have been talking about. Okay. Well, Justin's comment there on how it might be warranted to, or would be warranted to run into VM already, like that immediately is a red line for me. So I'm actually going to start reading more of what he posted after this meeting. But uh, these are all really good points. I'll uh, just get on board with the, uh, the agenda I should stick to. I think everyone's had ample time to hop on board. And if not, I'll just keep an eye on the roster there. So let's see, attendance. Um, is there anyone that uh, we could volunteer as a scribe slash meeting minute taker today? We could use up to two if possible. Seems we have at least one person starting to type in the scribe role there, so I'll take that. Thank you, Ray. And if someone else is able to, ah, Ash. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ash. Perfect. All right, let's get this underway. Uh, attendance check in here. Uh, are there any working groups or SIGs or partner groups that have any check ins today or anything to bring up? I don't see anything in the attendance thus far. So we got Capos and uh, Michael Schwartz. Okay. It looks like they have uh, updates. Okay, I'll just go from the top of the list down. So Good day, Justin. Floor is yours. Hey, uh, yeah, great. Just have a quick update. So, um, as I I wonder if uh, I didn't check to see if Andreas is on here, whether he'll give an update or talk or anything about the harbor assessment. But that's going along well. Uh, one thing I wanted to just kind of mention in general that um, I think I'm going to be adding a little more clarity to in the assessment plan documents like the way which you do a security assessment is to make sure that groups are being very explicit about um, like uh, how they handle security compromises and failures. I, I don't literally mean like a zero day uh, issue here. I could mean it, this could be something like um, an administrator makes a mistake and accidentally discloses a private key or um, you know, somebody steals uh, like a login credential for a party or things like that. And uh, to talk about not only sort of the potential damage one can cause in those cases, but also the ways in which you, you mitigate them. Because um, I think that that uh, needs, is, is one of the most important things. And I think 
uh, can, can be missed with our current process. So I'll, I will add some text to make that more explicit. Um, that's all I really wanted to say for the update, but things are going well with Harbor and they will likely present, um, I think in something like two weeks, if, if we're open for them, um, given the scope of the project and things and the fact that they've presented a bazillion times to the TOC and everywhere else, um, we may send out, have them send out something ahead of the meeting to indicate to people, hey, like watch this five to 10 minute primer on Harbor so you have at least some background um, so that we're not spending all the time answering like very, very basic questions about like, what is this thing? Um, that's it for my Thank you, Justin. Just, Justin, just a clarifying question. Um, I see in the issue that uh, um, it's noted for next week. Um, do, do you expect it to, to need to, you know, yeah. another week? Okay. No, um, I, I don't think so. Twenty second would be next week. I'm not trying to make that that uh, that judgment. Um, I had, I wasn't remembering whether it was. Uh, the upcoming week or the week after. So I, that's why I left it vague, not because I have, got it, I want to make any uh, claim. So on the issue, um, you know, got it lined up for, for next week and I want to make sure we, you know, kind of uh, um, give it enough visibility and uh, get that lined up. It'd be, it'd be great if we had a presentation since we've had uh, a couple working sessions back to back. Excellent. I had a question on that, uh, Justin, this is Vinay uh, here. Uh, you know, what is the exit criteria? I mean, uh, so I think Michael had also asked the same question. Uh, so at what point does, do, you, do we conclude this? Is there some kind of guidance as to resolving all the comments, et cetera? They're working on resolving comments and they have been pretty diligent about it. Um, one thing that I said in that, working meeting on Monday, and uh, we'll repeat again here for the record, is um, like this is a process that's done kind of when it's done. And um, we're not, you know, it's not something where um, there's like a, there's like a game clock and we have to just, you know, stop at that specific time. On the other hand, because they're being so responsive and, and have been, you know, helping us, I think it's reasonable to expect that um, at least the parts of the document that we've had a chance to see uh, are in reasonable enough shape that they're that they're kind of ready to go that we can make a recommendation and and um, you know sort of say our thoughts about there's some things missing um, uh, those actually revolve around the things that I had just mentioned uh, like understanding kind of the blast radius when things go wrong and how to recover and what the implications are um, but I, but presumably we'll be able to finish, um, you know, if they continue at the pace they had before and get us that information in the next 24 hours or so, I think um, we probably will be able to, to wrap it up. Uh, but we don't have, um, we have not yet uh, in the ones that we've completed, the two of them that we've completed, we haven't yet had a firm uh, timeline in part because we're still trying to, um, you know, figure out and, and different groups have different amounts of time they take to do things as, you know, things come up for the security um, assessors and so on. So. Got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for Justin? Okay, we'll uh, send the mic over to Michael Schwartz. Good day, Michael. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, can I share my screen? Let me try. Let's see, we've got your video feed still. So I have to kill that too. Okay, let me try sharing. I got I it. You have to um, drop the video, just the little share thing takes over. Gotcha. Um, yep, we see but, your, uh, your browser with CNC. Okay. So, so this is just, um, I guess, the first time I'm, I'm presenting to the group. I, um, you know, was inquiring about contributing the core glue technology to CNCF and I was directed here. And I put together these slides. Um, I also, there, I know that there was some formal questions. I, I addressed those sort of at the end, but if it's okay, maybe I'll give some background about where, where we're coming from 
and you know some of the some of the goals of glue and then and then maybe at the end or or later we can we can dive into the the questionnaire is that okay uh, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm just checking here the presentations. Uh, was this part of... Um... Okay, yeah, sounds good. Please go ahead. I can send it. It's weird, weirdly, it's not seeing it showing in my whole pre whole screen here. Huh, I don't know why. It's a weird Zoom thing. Um, I'll, I'll just stay on the slide deck. Um, okay. so, um, so, so you might know Glue. Um, we've been around, we'll be 11 years in May. We have the team is very globally distributed. Um, we're on every continent, basically, except Antarctica. Um, the counting the deployments over the years, you know, we, we estimate around 3,000 deployments. And uh, the, the business model for Glue is we sell support on the Glue server, and we have serving mostly large enterprise customers around the world. So there's 50 enterprise customers, um, good partner network, and anyway, so that's a little background about us. Um, the Glue server, so what can be confusing to people is differentiating the Glue server from its components. So the Glue server, I tell people it's a little like Red Hat. You could think of Red Hat as a distribution of open source components, some of which Red Hat wrote, some of which they didn't, but they're integrated together, um, given a version, supported for years, so it's productized. And the Glue server is like that. So the, it consists of a number of different products, um, and that's our commercial product, um, the Glue server. And I'm not proposing that, um, now that product, um, some of those products are um, you know, conducive to be made cloud native, some of them aren't, but I'm not proposing that we make the Glue server, um, um, that we contribute that to CNCF. Um, what I'm proposing is that we contribute um, what, what is really the core technology of Glue, which is the OAuth um, um, OpenID FIDO part of Glue. Um, so really the, the cutting edge part of Glue um, as, as a new project um, at CNCF. Um, so this isn't where we are today, but this is where we're, we're moving to. Um, um, so the, the core OAuth service, um, the FIDO service, which is currently integrated into the OAuth service, but we think we can break that out. Um, a SKIM service, um, which, which is currently in our admin component, but we think we can break this out. And a config service, which is also currently in our, in our admin service. But the basic idea is, you know, different components for, um, but the OAuth service is really the one that drives most of the functionality and the performance. So just sort of a high level vision. Um, now, now the Glue server, um, if you look at the, the market for access management, um, there's a lot of solutions out there and we have very specific um, segment that we're serving. And it's always been the high end of the segment. Um, we felt like the low end of the identity segment is well served by SaaS services like Okta. And um, so the design for the Glue server was always to be really fast um, horizontal scalability was an important design goal from day one. Um, low operating costs. Um, so customers or who deploy the Glue server, um, they'd probably rather use a SaaS like Okta, but they can't. But given the, given that we want, even though um, they might prefer a SaaS, we want to focus on making it as easy as possible and keeping their long-term costs down because operations just goes on forever and it ends up being the biggest portion of your total cost of ownership. So we always focus on low operating cost. Flexibility was really important to us. Um, it turns out that you'd think authentication is like everyone does the same, but it turns out that everyone's authentication business logic is a little different. And we wanted to make sure that you could implement your business uh, rules without forking the code. Forking the code means makes it hard for, for end users because they have to merge their codes, merge their updates, and it, it makes it hard to keep current with the latest version. So we created sort of interfaces that allow you to customize the behavior of the Glue server without having to fork. And there's currently like 14 of them. We're adding a couple more. Um, we have a loose persistence to, to the persistence layer. So a lot of the performance of Glue 
is driven by the database that it connects to. Um, initially, we built Glue around LDAP, like most of the other access management platforms out there. Um, two or three years ago, we decided to implement another database. Um, we chose Couchbase. Um, in the future, we actually, on the roadmap this year, we're looking at supporting Amazon, um, maybe DynamoDB is, is what we're thinking. Um, but, but basically, there's an abstracted persistence layer and caching layer so that we can imp implement different persistence backends. Um, we've always had a test-driven development strategy, so you have to, you can't submit features unless you su submit the, the, the corresponding tests. And as a design goal, um, when Glue started in 2009, there was probably like 20 other companies who, or organizations that had a SAML product. So we always said we wanted to be the best in the next thing, which in 2009 was OAuth and OpenID. So we've made a big investment in sort of um, being on the cutting edge and really being innovative in, in the OAuth area. Um, so a little bit of a spoiler, we just put out this press release yesterday and it's showing, uh, we basically did a benchmark where we started one morning and we spooled up enough servers to, to, to show a sustained rate that would get us to a billion authentications per day. And when our competitors do this, they tend to do, you know, they tend to hit the back channel endpoint and send the username password and call that an authentication. But what we did was actually show how do you scale the web tier because in OpenID, you're talking about presenting a web page, processing the, you know, returning the code, trading the code plus client credentials, um, getting a token, hitting the user info endpoint. So we looked at the whole um, web-based OpenID flow, not just sending the username and password and calling that authentication. And how do you scale that to a, a, a sustained rate of a billion authentications per day? It's a pretty hard problem. Um, I did benchmarking for Rackspace. Um, we were trying to achieve this. We never could with LDAP-based um, infrastructures, or if we could, it was only by using proxies, which were really hard to scale up and required a, a lot of operational expertise in terms of how do you uh, manage a database. We were able to do this test um, basically because of advances in cloud native technology and um, advances in the persistence, in scaling the persistence. Um, but there's no other, I don't think there's any other commercially available system that can do this. Um, other systems tend to show how they could maybe scale, but they can't scale, like they can't auto scale to get to this rate. Um, I'll, I'll go more into the benchmark results um, later on, um, but, um, but just to give you an idea. So in terms of the quality of the implementation, Glue has always been a leader in the um, interop testing um, before there was OpenID certification, there was the interops. Um, these are results from interop four that shows that Glue, this is from 2013, January. So Glue was actually leading the interops in OpenID Connect um, before companies like Ping and Fordrock um, even had a server. So we were pretty early on um, leaders in OpenID. Um, today you can check the certification page and see that you know Glue 4.0 um, we submitted all the tests, we're passing all the tests. Um, um, we are also, we have login tests, which haven't even been published. We're, we're ready to pass those and submit those. We submitted Glue um, we, to the, um, there's a FAPI OpenID provider um, set of conformance uh, profiles. And um, Glue 4.2, which we're about to release is, um, passes both of those. So Glue is a very comprehensive OpenID Connect implementation. I would also say that these tests are like the bare minimum of what you should be doing. You could drive a truck through what's not in these tests. Um, there's a lot of missing negative tests also. Um, so I would say, in my opinion, these tests are the bare minimum of what vendors should be doing. Um, we're also the only implementation to recertify four times. Um, it's important that when you make a new release, you're according to the terms of service, you're supposed to re, um, recertify, and we've done that. Um, but we're the only implementation to actually recertify four times. I think we'd be the only one to recertify three times even. Um, so going a little bit into what's in there, 
in, in the OpenID Connect, um, we implement basically all of, all of the different um, you know, features, including um, dynamic client registration, um, which is actually a pretty important feature um, for autom automation of managing clients. Um, discovery um, is the configuration endpoint. Um, front channel, back channel, logout. Um, um, SEBA is a new OpenID um, profile that is used for call center um, um, push notifications to mobile devices. So if you call at your bank and they want to push a notification to your phone, um, there's a new, the new OpenID standard for that. That'll be in 4.2. There's also a certification that we expect to pass in 4.2 for that. Quick question, Michael. Sorry to cut yeah. in. I should have asked this at the beginning. Do you want to tackle questions as they arise or do you prefer to shelve them all for the end of the presentation? Um, let me, let me um, feel free to put the questions in the Zoom and I'll tackle them at the end because uh, they might be answered along the way. Got it. Um, um, we implemented, actually GLUE's the most comprehensive implementation of this profile called UMA, User Managed Access. Um, it's actually, um, we're one of four implementations that, that supports this profile, but we're the only implementation that implements the authorization endpoint um, in OAuth, you, there's two endpoints. There's the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint. Um, token is back channel, authorization is front channel. Um, Glue is the only one that actually implements the front channel endpoint, which is critical um, for use cases where you want to get consent. Like G, um, in GDPR, the European Privacy Regulations, you might want to get per consent from a user um, um, to um, call an API on their behalf. Um, you might need, there's also use cases in the healthcare industry for consent to medical records, um, stuff like that. So we like UMA, especially where consent of the user is needed after authentication happens and you need to go back to the, to interact with the user. Um, we love FIDO. Um, we've built uh, FIDO into the Glue server, um, including U2F and, and FIDO2. Um, we actually, um, Maybe this is a little bit of a, a, a non sequitur, but we um, implemented a skim endpoint endpoint for FIDO also, because one important question becomes: Okay, what happens when you lose your FIDO token? You need some way to to unassociate that FIDO token from the person. So, in addition to the FIDO endpoints that are defined in the specs, we also have a skim profile for FIDO um, that is conducive if you want to enable um, user or um, a user self-service portal um, to allow users to say, okay, those tokens are really small. Eventually, you're going to lose the thing. You need to handle that. Um, I mentioned SKIM. Um, we have a, a very comprehensive implementation of SKIM. Um, we did interops with SailPoint and Ping and others. Um, this has been in production a long time. SKIM 2 is actually st um, pretty standard. If you don't know what SKIM is, it's basically there's a slash users endpoint and you can post to add a user, um, put or patch to edit a user. Um, but Glue has a database with user information in it. And this, this is one of the ways um, that you can get user information in there and probably the most uh, scalable way. Um, so a little bit about the architecture. Um, Glue, the Glue server is written, it's built with the Weld platform. Um, we, we like the stability of this platform um, and, um, and, and Glue has a lot of code. Um, so we're, we're, we're using it extensively. Um, let me just say a little bit more about, um, well, um, I think I have some, another slide later, but so we actually are, oh, I mentioned it um, somewhere, but anyway, yeah, here. So we're, we're looking at other um, um, platforms um, for the smaller services, the FIDO service, the SKIM service, the config service. For those services, we can use lighter weight, um, like Quarkus is what we're looking at, but there's, for, for these smaller services, I think it's okay. Um, but there's some, for the, for the core OAuth service, um, even though it might be uh, you know, larger than we might like, um, we still feel that um, the stability is really important for us. Um, for this kind of product, um, we, we need the stability. Um, and we think it's been serving us well. Um, there's been a lot of features in here that we like. Um, we deploy in a Jetty servlet container. Um, so we don't require 
um, an EJB, even though it's Weld, um, we don't we don't need a um, an EJB server like Wildfly or, or something like that. Um, and um, we're we're actually using the Amazon um, um, JDK um, is is what we're using. Um, um, we've you're probably all familiar with those issues, but um, okay. So persistence, Glue does a lot of persistence. Um, you wouldn't think so, but users, clients, um, um, some types of tokens like um, like long lived refresh tokens, um, those types of things need to be written to a disk, and those um, and and that ends up being the barrier for performance. Um, is write operations and replication ends up being really a, a, an important um, driver for um, um, when you want to scale. And um, so um, we have a, an, as I mentioned, an abstracted interface um, that allows us to maintain um, different, um, different backends. Um, LDAP and Couchbase for us supporting backends is a big deal because it's not just doing the mapping, it's also you know, doing enough performance testing to make sure that we have the queries optimized and the, uh, everything else about it, the operational replication, there's really a lot to it. So before we take on a new database, it's not a trivial undertaking. Um, we're targeting DynoDB, DynamoDB. Um, um, the, um, uh, we know a lot of our customers don't wanna be in the in the database management business at all. They really just rather like use a cloud database. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. Um, RDBMS has been a no-go for us. We'd actually like to see a, an RDBMS for smaller applications, um, but because of issues with replication um, and scaling, um, it hasn't been a priority for our use case, which is performance and horizontal scalability. Um, Caching is really important also. Um, actually. Um, um, so we support a number of different cache models. Um, um, Couchbase has memory buckets. Um, this is good when you need multi-data center replication of the cache. We also support Redis and in-memory. We support database caching, which might sound like an oxymoron, um, but it, it eliminates the need for the cache because we can use the database for replication. So in cases where maybe performance isn't needed and you want to simplify the number of components, you can actually specify the database instead of, a, instead of the cache. Um, but, um, but, man, but there's some data where it would kill your performance to write it to the disk, like the code and the authorization code flow. It's only a, you should be used one time. So there's just no point in writing it to the disk. Um, so for those types of like short-lived objects, we need to use the cache. Um, there's pre-authentication state. There's a number of cases where it's not just the persistence you need to think about, but also the caching. Um, I mentioned the interception scripts before as a way to, as an upgrade-friendly way to implement um, business logic. Um, the scripts are written in Python. Um, the, we, 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 we are, um, have shied away from Java. Um, having worked, you know, for 10 years before I started Glue, I, I worked with every um, SSO platform out there that was available at the time. And I felt like Java was a big barrier to system administrators. And so our goal was, even though we love Java at Glue, um, was to expose an easier interface for customization. We chose Python as a syntax. We could have chose, chosen JavaScript or Groovy, but we, we chose Python partially because I'm a big Python fan. Um, we used Jython because that's that was the Java implementation of, of Python that made it easy for us um, to implement. Um, in the future, I think we might actually um, enable an, uh, these interfaces in pure Java. Um, we're, that's on our feature um, wish list. Um, but these Jython scripts have served us well and have enabled our customers to implement lots of crazy, like, um, you know, use cases that we never thought possible. Like, I've never heard any customer say, I need to do this with a Glue server and I can't. Um, we've seen all sorts of, like, very creative implementations um, um, of Glue to get, to get various use cases done. Um, out of the box, we still have a lot of two-factor support. Um, social login, inbound SAML, um, FIDO authentication, which I mentioned, one-time password, SMS, X509 certificates. Um, I have a link down here to even more. Um, reset your password after 90 days. 
you know, try these two LDAP servers on the back end, call this API. There's basically like lots of um, um, different ways you can implement um, how the user gets authenticated. Um, there's lots of other interesting interception scripts. Introspection, OAuth token introspection is one that's used a lot when you want to add scopes or otherwise stuff other information into the OAuth token. Um, client registration, um, if you want to use software statements um, to as an alternate trust model to lock down dynamic client registration, maybe it's too open for you. So there's, there's a bunch of ways you can implement these scripts to um, meet your business model. Um, okay, so there's a, actually, o OAuth is a big topic. If you look at the OAuth working group at the IETF, you'll see there's like, I think 18 RFCs, there's a, probably like another 10 draft RFCs at least. So OAuth, like LDAP is a bunch of specs, you know, related. Um, OAuth is the same thing. It's not just RFC 6749, it's actually the whole, a whole bunch of these related um, um, RFCs that have come about to promote best practices and also to mitigate um, certain vulnerabilities of OAuth that have been discovered over time. Um, Glue, um, we, imp we implement PKCE, that's a really important one. Um, and anyway, I don't want to get, get um, go into the weeds too much, but it's a pretty good implementation. So um, um, one, of, one of the um, important directions we're going at Glue is, is to align with um, cloud native um, design principles. And in fact, um, so we, we currently have two products. Um, one, one we call Community Edition, which is based on VMs. Um, that's actually going in the direction of Snap. Um, we currently have a Chirrut, but we're, we're, we're beta testing um, Snap, which is a new distribution packaging strategy for customers who aren't ready or don't have economies of scale to go cloud native. Um, but for our larger customers, especially consumer and, and citizen facing applications, we're really pushing customers towards our Kubernetes Helm distribution of Glue. Um, and um, anyway, we did a quick chest checklist to see, you know, how we're aligning with some of these principles. Um, you, you can maybe, I don't want to um, go into too much detail here, but you can, you can check it later. Um, we have a huge effort on Kubernetes, year, years long effort in, um, in and, and even before Kubernetes was out, we were looking at how to um, use orchestration. For example, some of you might remember Juju. Um, uh, we tried that. We were, we were trying, basically we knew we had this auto scaling problem um, before Juju, we were looking at platforms like Puppet and other configuration management. We, we knew we had to figure out some way to auto scale. Kubernetes really solved those problems for us um, once and for all, um, but not without a lot of work, um, years of work, um, partially because as you know, the platform itself was changing a lot. As, as we were innovating, there'd be new versions of everything. It was really a lot of work. But after, t uh, after um, you know, um, two and a half years or so, we really have a pretty solid um, Kubernetes um, Helm distribution of the Glue assets, each service running in its own container. Um, all of that is open source. Um, and um, if you go to glue.org slash docs, you'll see there's Kubernetes installation. But this gave us really the, the auto scaling we could not otherwise achieve. No other platform enabled us to do it. Um, the, the automation, the failover, you, you guys are already drinking the Kool-Aid, so you know the, the advantages. Um, so I mentioned before on the benchmark results, actually in the press release, there are our instructions on how to replicate our benchmark. Um, and um, and we, actually, we, we actually did benchmark both the resource owner um, um, password credential flow. This is basically where you're just sending the username password to the token endpoint and asking for a token. Um, we also um, benchmark the authorization um, code flow. Um, but this is, um, um, it, again, um, in the press release, there's a link. In the Glue docs, we actually documented how to achieve these results. Um, I, I believe that um, for the, for the um, code flow, um, it took almost 500 glue server, 500 servers. There's no way you're splitting up 500 VMs um, to do this. So, 
Um, so you really need the scalability. And we do think that actually this scalability it was previously only available, like sure, Google and Microsoft and Okta and Auth0, they can do this. Um, but you can't license their technology stack for authentication, uh, or not even license, you can't deploy. Um, so we really feel like this is the first um, sort of stack where you as a cloud provider can say, I need to authenticate like Google at that scale, and here's a recipe for, for how to do it. Um, so in talking with um, some of my friends at Linux Foundation, um, um, if we were to contribute the core glue technology, it has to be rebranded. Um, now we actually have a separate um, open source and, um, um, and commercial brand. So the, 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 the open source stuff at glue, we've always, we've always had prefix it OX. So there's OXAuth, there's OXTrust, there's OXD. Um, but we decided actually we can go we can go further and maybe break and just come up with a, a totally new name. Um, over the years, I've gotten complaints about Oxoth um, being Im impossible to say for French speakers. Um, also, um, I'm not sure I love the metaphor of an ox being a castrated uh, male cattle. So, um, so I'm up for so we're up for changing the name, um, suggesting a new name named after racing pigeons, the fastest racing pigeons on the planet um, were bred by these guys, Janssen. So Janssen racing pigeons are, um, are sort of the, known for being the fastest pigeons in the world. I'm proposing that as a new name. Um, I, have some more, um, um, I have some more comments that specifically address, maybe I'll just leave these um, for people who are reading offline because I don't think I want to read this much text. And let, let me take the, the questions. Um, there was just actually a, um, um, a, re a release for Jython um, um, that, um, so there, is a, there was a new um, Jython release that we're, we're integrating in, into 4.2. Um, um, you know, we are, you know, as I mentioned, we are looking at other um, interfaces, um, for example, just exposing pure Java as an alternative. Um, we try not to be paternalistic at Glue and realize that our customers have a range of security requirements. Um, some of them are very paranoid, like the, the Navy is a customer of Glue, the US Navy. Um, and, and while so others of them are um, in other areas and using the Glue server for other things where maybe they're not quite as paranoid. And so, um, um, so I think that um, it's important to remember that um, security is about mitigation, not about perfection, and the extent of mitigation um, that we, we want to leave that up to. Um, we want to make good default choices for the customer, but we also want to leave, um, you know, some um, flexibility to the customers to find the right security um, profile that that meets their needs. Um, this is especially true in Open ID where there's lots of signing and encryption options. And we're not saying you have to use them all. We want to make them available to you and then let the customer choose. Um, so the question about Jython and, and Python 2.7, um, um, you know, potentially you, you could uh, map other scripting interfaces. You could do Groovy or JavaScript. We had that idea in the past. Um, I think for, the, for how these things are exposed and compiled, um, I, I think it's okay. Um, um, I'd like to see what is the attack, you know, that we're mitigating, what's the likelihood of that attack. So I think that just, just saying sort of knee jerk, um, we should get rid of this. Um, but um, yeah, thank you. Those are the slides. Um, you know, it's maybe premature. Um, it's something we can look at, but um, um, the other question is, let me just read it. How many enterprises are in production with the core aspects being discussed today? Um, um, so, well, I said around 50. I mean, er, almost all the Glue customers have to be using this core feature. You can't use Glue without using this OpenID Connect component. Um, the SAML components are chained. So when you do a SAML authentication, we actually redirect you to the OpenID Connect provider to be authenticate and send you back to the SAML IDP. So there's no way to use Glue without using this portion of Glue. Um, and um, so we do have a commercial product called Cluster Manager. 
um, but this isn't a cloud native product. This is only for VMs. So there, there's two cluster strategies at Glue. There's Kubernetes and Helm, which is open source. Um, and then, but, it's, but some of our customers aren't ready for cloud native or they don't have economies of scale um, um, or they can't, they don't have an elastic Kubernetes service available that, to them and they don't know how to build one. Um, and so we have another distribution of Glue um, using um, pack, Linux packages. And if you're using these Linux packages, we have a commercial product called Cluster Manager, which is a deployment tool that helps you, that makes it easy for you to deploy um, a, a highly available topology of Glue servers. Um, it's not used at runtime, it's just a deployment tool, but that tool is commercially licensed. Um, we actually document how you can cluster Glue um, in the documentation. So there's no secret about what Cluster Manager is doing. Um, but I also say, you know, to the open source uh, business people out there, just because your product's open source doesn't mean that everything you write has to be open source. And this tool we figured saved customers a lot of time, um, um, created commonality across cluster deployments for this um, VM distribution, and um, we felt like it was fair game to um, um, to license it. Um, but um, so th there's no, I wouldn't say that clustering is commercial. Um, Kubernetes clustering is, is that's built in and, and free. Um, you can cluster it. Um, you just can't use our, you know, cluster deployment tool to cluster it. Um, that makes sense. Um, let's see. I think um, they're still um, a bit confused about which parts of our uh, software is commercial or not. Kubernetes in general, the the setup of Kubernetes with Glue is, is not commercial. The cluster manager um, is is um, using VMs. It's nothing um, close to what Kubernetes uh, does uh, on the cloud side. So it's, it's not even, uh, they're two different tools. Kubernetes and that deploy and the deployment that it brings to Glue is all open source, and you can you can just follow the docs on how to install that. So there's nothing commercial about that, and that's what we used in the press release. That's that's how we reached the scale. We didn't use Cluster Manager for that. Right. Well, also keep in mind that what we agree to support, like the software, the the binaries, um, the documentation, that's all open source. But that doesn't mean we have to support you. Um, Glue does a lot of community support. Um, you can look at our support forums, and we have a whole team that does nothing but community support. Um, we find that actually supporting clusters is an enterprise requirement, um, and, and plus we would need to expand our community support capability. And we feel like um, um, we can't support the world. You know, we can give you everything, we can document it, but um, but we are, what we choose to support commercially, um, the community can answer other community questions about clustering, but, um, um, but we don't feel like we have an obligation um, to um, support. Um, and support is what we sell. And, and so there has to be a business model. That's our business model. And um, we, we, we want to support, um, I always say, you know, open source, we're not a charity for big businesses. Um, we give a lot of free software. We do a lot of stuff for free. We also have to figure out some way to fund all of that good stuff. And, um, and, the, and what we sell is support. Um, there is no, um, so Glue is not open core. There is no enterprise version or, um, or community version. There's just one version of Glue. There's one specific tool, cluster manager, that's licensed. And as, as we've said about four times, that tool only relates to VM deployment. It's not, you would never use that if you're using Kubernetes. Um, so everything at Glue, we don't believe in open core because we believe that that creates a bad incentive or it creates a conflict of interest with the developers um, where developers are saying, well, what should I work on? The, the, the enterprise features or the open source features and the enterprise features end up having more priority so we didn't want to create that bifurcation of, of motivations at Glue. So there's only one version of the Glue server. Um, but, um, um, 
Um, so it, it, it might not be um, as clear on the marketing, but um, um, there's really, um, if you look at Glue, not only is the Glue server open source, but Glue Gateway, our, our API gateway based on Kong Community Edition, that's open source, our plugins are open source. Um, Super Glue, our mobile app is open source. Um, also our client software, Oxidy, and um, what am I missing? CASA, our two-factor credential um, application, all open source. However, we're just we're not talking about those those projects. Those are separate projects. We're really just talking about the core OAuth Open ID service in Glue, which we think is the most relevant um, to the cloud um, community. Um, I like this last question about um, what do we want to get from CNCF membership? Well, we want to build the community for Glue. Um, that, that's that's the main reason. Is um, so we've done a good job, I think, getting the product to where it is today. Um, but in order for, uh, we think it would be hugely advantageous to us um, if we could uh, attract a bigger community to collaborate with. And the C and and by um, aligning with the governance model of CNCF and making um, um, Glue is pretty stable at this point. You know, we've implemented a lot of features, so. Um, at this point, we, we think that if we could formalize um, how features get added to the glue and create a more consensus-driven approach um, to, to that process, um, we see collaboration opportunities with other CNCF projects. Um, in particular, we already have an integration with OPA um, in our gateway product, but we really are big fans of the declarative security model of OPA. Um, also, we like Falco. Um, a lot of our customers um, need a multi-tiered security approach and having Falco um, to uh, monitor sort of the kernel level um, um, events to detect anomalous um, activity, that's really interesting to us. And when we, so we're, we're excited about some of the other projects, but the main overriding goal for us is, you know, um, there's actually a number of, of large organizations that we're working with um, today um, that would um, like to collaborate on the Glue server more closely and moving um, Glue, the, the core technology, out of Glue, the company, and, and um, into a foundation um, would provide some assurances. And every once in a while, I mean, we've been committed to open source for 10 years, but every once in a while, we still get you know, uh, questions about, what if somebody buys Glue? You know, what if you decide to unopen source? So we think that moving the core technology to a foundation would um, eliminate some of those questions um, and also um, um, enable some of our partners um, like Idemia, who's mentioned in the, in the press release. Um, they're a very large publicly traded identity um, security company. Um, so the glue is very tactical for them. Um, um, Evernote, who I, who's I mentioned in the in the slides later on, is one of our customers. Um, they're they're um, deploying uh, Glue at, at scale, um, and um, also service um, um, other companies who want to launch their own Okta. Um, so we have a number of partners um, globally um, who want to launch a hosted identity service based on Glue. And so moving, moving Glue to CNCF, we believe would create a more, um, um, would create the governance structure, which would enable us to collaborate with a larger ecosystem of, of developers. I'm gonna jump in just quickly, Michael, uh, it's 10.54. I'm just gonna call it, stop in one more minute, just for, okay. Didn't mean to cut into. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we. Got a number of questions that Michael's gone through here. If there's any additional ones, we can just post them or reach out to you afterwards, presumably. Uh, with the last Michael, so good. Yeah, um, just a, uh, a, a clarification on Jensen versus Glue. Um, you know, as you're going through this, uh, you know, I'll be honest, uh, disentangling Glue, the company, Glue server, and all the various components uh you know to you know figure out um you know which aspects we're advocating for um you know lots of setup 
uh, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, besides, you know, just being able to say uh, it's the OAuth part, um, you know, uh, not having a, uh, a focused project to focus on uh, is really hard. Um, so, you know, is, is, it, is it a correct understanding that Jensen would be um, that circumscribed OAuth component tree uh, that you're considering uh you know bringing into the cncf or is that uh you know the glue server that uh, is open source uh and you know the, the name going forward yeah so so the closest thing that we have is really ox auth um th that's our core oauth um fido component today um so we're really talking about renaming that jansen um Okay. Um, breaking out the FIDO. Um, FIDO is only like a couple of endpoints. It's not a really big part of the Glue server, but we don't want to hold back innovation of FIDO for new versions of, of the OAuth server because FIDO is a, um, perhaps on a, could be, you know, if we have a new FIDO release, maybe we should don't have to wait for the next release of OAuth. So we want to de decouple these things. Um, really, you need a config service. We already have a config API, but we're breaking that out. Um, um, into a separate lightweight config API. And the skim service likewise also exists, but we just want to break that out. Um, so the, these are the four. You need the skim service because you need a way to add, edit, delete users in the Glue server. Um, you need the config service so you can automate not just deployment, but also configuration of the Glue server. Um, and FIDO and OAuth we see as, as, as core services. Um, so th this is really, um, this bundle um, of services is, is what Janssen would be. Um, but OxAuth today has OAuth and FIDO, um, and our Ox Trust has Skim and Config. Um, so, we, but, um, so basically, we're, we're actually doing this right now, is we're, we're breaking these guys out, and we would bundle this all as one new project um, called Janssen. Got it. Thank you. Michael, um, we have a couple minutes left for open floor. Does anyone have any additional topics they'd like to bring up? And uh, if there's any additional questions for Michael, Michael, can we reach out to you via the ticket number 366 associated with this presentation or could we Absolutely. Wrap up? Okay, perfect. Uh, does anyone have anything else they'd like to bring up in the last few minutes before hard stop? Okay, 10 seconds of cricket says no. So, <laughs> you know, there from Mike. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for putting on this presentation today. And with that, I think we'll call it a stop and hope everyone stays happy and healthy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers. <laughs>